You'll know that we are in a sermon series called Christmas at the Movies, and today we're looking at Home Alone. Who in here, Home Alone, is your favorite Christmas movie? I see a few hands, quite a few hands that are up. Uh, For me, Home Alone is one of my top movies, partly because the movie came out when I was eight years old. And the protagonist, Kevin, is eight years old in the movie. And so I remember watching it and having all these fantasies of what it would be like to be left home alone in my own house. Some have asked, why are we doing Christmas at the movies? Why are we using these movies uh, throughout this season? Well, part of it is because Jesus was a storyteller. And Jesus told pretty ordinary stories to tell profound and extraordinary truths about God. And some of the ordinary stories that we know are the things that we know from books and television and movies, including uh, the movies of Christmas. And so what we're doing is looking at them as a window to look at particular parts of the gospel that the Christmas story might come alive once again. For the few of you who may not have seen Home Alone or not seen it in a while, the the story goes is that Kevin, this eight-year-old boy, has a little bit of an argument with his parents, is banished up to the uh, upstairs in his home, and in the scurry and flurry of a wild morning um, where the power goes out and the whole extended family is headed off to, uh, to Paris, Kevin gets left home alone. Now, uh, there they are, and they, they, the parents head off to Paris, and the family does, and uh, Kevin wakes up, and his family is gone, and uh, someone uh, said online that the whole movie plot would be solved if there were cell phones, right? Uh, simply just, like, call Kevin and say, hey, are you doing okay? Do you have a neighbor you can stay with or whatever? And Yeah, Mom, I'm fine. Don't eat too much ice cream. Okay, yeah, we're good. But instead, uh, Kevin recognizes that there's an external threat that's happening to his house. There are two guys named Marvin Harry. They're the wet bandits. In part two, they become the sticky bandits, but that's a different story. And, and there, Kevin knows that they're coming to attack the house, and so he spends time coming up with all of these torture devices to uh, make sure that the home is protected, including... Uh, having an iron fall down, the laundry chute, a tarantula on one of their faces, using a blowtorch to uh, scald the top of one of their heads, crushing up ornaments that they might step on barefoot, micro machines, if you remember those tiny little cars, that would be slick to fall on. Friends, Kevin is a sadist, <laughs> right? Kevin, Kevin loves hurting people, you know, and it's just a strange thing to look at the movie now, but one of the things is it's an endlessly rewatchable movie. Can you believe it's 33 years old? It's uh, an endlessly rewatchable movie, and oh, they've tried to make Home Alone 3, 4, and 5, and all the rest, but nothing can quite match the original. And I think part of it is because Home Alone has heart. It has a message in that is cooked therein that helps not only to give us a sense of what's most important in the Christmas season, but I think there's some truths that we can learn about God within the midst of it. And I'm going to get right into it. There's three things, three lessons I think we can learn about God from the movie Home Alone. The first is this, is that being home alone is overrated. (laughs) Being home alone is overrated. Um, We're going to uh, watch this first clip. Uh, This is, uh, Kevin has, um, they've ordered pizza for the whole family. Um, and his older brother, uh, Buzz, eats the last piece of cheese. Kevin's mad at Buzz. He, like, linebacker plows into him, and it knocks over all of the stuff, causes a big mess. If you watch the movie again, you'll notice that it actually, uh, they actually, when they wipe the counter off, they wipe Kevin's ticket off as well, and it goes in the trash can, which helps to understand why they don't have an extra ticket. So, ah, yeah, so, yeah, it's pretty amazing. All right, let's watch this first clip. <laughs> I could just we I wanted him to come in here and put his hands on his face like home alone because my son looks a whole lot like him but uh Kevin just continues to get into all sorts of hijinks right he not only jumps on the bed but he breaks into he, he starts watching all these rated R movies he raids his brother's cabinet and pulls down his secret collection of toys and and other things he does whatever he wants he's just one scene where he's sitting there and he's eating this massive bowl of ice cream with these chips and Pepsis and all the rest 
And at one point he realizes that he's got a terrible, terrible stomach ache. He takes that aftershave in the morning when he's trying his best to be a grown-up, slaps it on his face, and recognizes how painful it has to be. And not just the pain from those silly moments, but also it doesn't take him long to start to miss his family. Even the ones who had talked ugly to him, even the ones who he said that he just wished would disappear, he starts to recognize that there's something within him that longs to be with community, that longs to be with those who he had hurt. Being home alone is overrated. In the gospel stories, there is a parable that Jesus tells of a a somewhat similar story. I think you'll be able to see the parallels. It comes to us from Luke chapter 15. Jesus has told a story of a lost coin. He tells a story of a lost sheep, and then he tells a story of a lost son, and it begins this way. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Okay, just real quick here, just to pause on this. Um, This is about the rudest thing you could say to your dad, okay? Um, In Jewish culture, the older son would get two-thirds share of the... uh, two-thirds share of the inheritance, and the, the younger son would get one-third. If there were more children, it would break up from then. But that was all contingent upon the fact that the dad was dead. Dad is still alive, and the younger son wants the money now. You can hear the echoes of Kevin saying, I don't want to see you for the rest of my life, as the younger son demands his share of the inheritance And he leaves the house. Let's keep going here in this passage. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. Imagine him leaving small town and heading off to Vegas, right? With everything he has in tow, ready to make a name for himself, ready to live life on his own. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself off to a citizen of that country who sent him to the field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Again, in Jewish culture and still to this day, uh, eating pork is not kosher. It's considered to be incredibly unclean And just the simple act of that puts you at odds with God and with those in community. Let alone being face down eating pig slop along with the hogs next to you. He goes from this place of great arrogance where he asks, he basically says, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money now. I'm going to go do my own thing. And he heads off. He spins it all very quickly and finds himself at the lowest of the low. Do you hear the story that Jesus is telling him again? It's like um, I remember when uh, I can't identify the names of my children because then I have to pay them money if I use it in the sermon. Um, <laughs> but, one, but one of them, uh, when they were very, very young, um, just about every situation, they would say, when I get bigger, <laughs> when I get bigger, I'll do this, that, or the other. There's this, this thought that when I grow up, when I get older, when I move out, when I'm on my own, You hear how that goes? When I go to college, when I'm an adult, I'm going to live my life by my rules. They didn't say all this. This is what we do, right? I'm going to live my life by my rules. I'm going to do things my way. But it doesn't take long, does it, some of our college students or our our young adults who are here to recognize that adulting is hard, (laughs) that living life on our own is difficult, that there's that time when we're off by ourselves doing things our way where we recognize just how much we miss the joys that happen at home. It doesn't take long for Kevin to realize that. It certainly doesn't take long for the younger son in the story to realize that as he's eating alongside with pigs. He says, my father's servants have it better than I do right now. And he chooses to go, he chooses to go back home. Uh, you remember at the beginning of COVID when we we went on the total lockdown and we were completely separated from each other. Some of you probably lived at home by yourself. Some of you with one person. Others of you were quarantined with an entire family. And for a while, it was was okay, right? 
for a while there were projects around the house that you got to do that you hadn't had time to do so for a while you got to binge the shows that you wanted or catch up on the books that you wanted to do for a while it was nice to sort of be here on your own and even for me as a pastor I'll tell you it was nice for a little while at the church I was at in Huntsville what we would do is we would record the worship service on Thursday evenings and so on Sunday mornings I got to do what a lot of people get to do (laughs) I got to sleep in I played golf a couple times I didn't watch myself on TV because that would be weird I got to just have brunch I got to hang out and and it was nice for a while but at a certain point I started to miss the people I started to miss the church. I started to miss the whole reason why we gather is not just to worship our God, but to be together with other brothers and sisters in Christ, to be a community where we mourn with those who mourn and rejoice with those who rejoice. Not only is being home alone overrated, being alone, being on our own, being all alone is certainly overrated as well each of us needs a place even with the grievances and annoyances that we have with our own family in our own community and even in our own church each of us needs a place where we can celebrate successes and we have shoulders to cry on where we can pray for each other we can bind each other's wounds and when we can remind each other of how much we are loved by god being home alone being all alone is overrated and the son realized that and it doesn't take Kevin very long to realize that, uh, that as well. There's a second truth that's found in the story of Home Alone. It's this, it's that it's never too late to return. It's never too late to turn around. It's never too late to return home. There's a sub-story in the, in the movie of Old Man Marley, who's, you know, the neighborhood serial killer. Everyone's got one of those, right? <laughs> It's just this like, it's just taken for granted. There's Marley out there with this, he's shoveling snow, and he, that's where he keeps the bodies in that trash can, right? And Buzz has got Kevin convinced that this is happening in his neighborhood. And Kevin, every time he sees old man Marley, is in complete and utter fear. To the point where uh, he's in, Kevin goes to church um, on uh, one of those evenings really to hide from the bandits. Ends up sitting there while Old Holy Night plays in the background. And as he's sitting there, old man Marley walks up and sits down next to him as Kevin's eyes get big as saucers. Let's watch this clip. The greatest screenwriter as John Hughes is in this moment. He didn't create the story, did he? <laughs> we can hear the very same themes in the story of the lost son from the very mouth of Jesus, this old man who has had a fight with his son, who knows how many years ago. They've gone their separate ways, and there is a great gulf that separates the two of them. You're the same with Kevin, who says, you know, sometimes I I, I feel like I don't love my family. I don't want to be around them, but deep down, deep down there is that longing. We see the same thing in the the gospel story. Listen to this in, in Luke chapter 17. It says, when the man came to his senses... Luke 15, 17 through 20. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out, and I'll go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and I have sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he got up, and he went to his father man comes to his senses and recognizes that even his father's servants have it better than he does he recognizes that indeed being home alone is overrated and they recognize in this cliff that both kevin and the old man have something in common they've had a fight with their family that's led to separation and in the short and the long term there's difficulty even though it's only been a few days for kevin and it may have been years for the old man we recognize in this moment and and as the clip would continue if you go back and you and you watch it you'll see that they sort of make a mutual pact that they're going to reach out and that they're going to reconcile they both decide to make a change friends it's never too late to do that with the ones that you love the ones from whom you are at odds with the ones with whom there is uh, a difficult conversation that needs to be had. It's never too late uh, for you to turn and to return home. It, it reminds me in the recovery community of, of doing your part to make sure your side of the street is cleaned up. 
to make, you can't control what someone else is going to do, but you certainly can control the way in which you respond and you reach out to that person. This in the story, you see the man seeking to make amends with the father that he has wronged, saying, Father, I, I'm going to come to my dad and I'm going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. Take me into your home, but make me one of your slaves. That's all I deserve. The man recognizes that at least his father would recognize him and bring him in as a slave in his house. But what we find is something far greater. And that leads us to the third truth. When we turn around, when we choose to return back home, when we, turn, when we choose to, to come back to the God who we have abandoned, we find that someone is coming back for us. In the story of Home Alone, what we see is that once Kevin's mom, Kate, has recognized her terrible, terrible mistake, and although she gets blamed in this, the dad is just as bad as well, right? They both leave him home alone. They recognize this on the plane, and from that moment, she stops at nothing to get home to her son. She makes all sorts of collect calls. Remember those? She makes all sorts of attempts to take any flight back. All the snow has closed down the airlines. It's difficult. She finds ways. She argues with the folks at the counter. She makes deals with folks. She exchanges her earrings to make sure that, this, that she can get the ticket that this older couple has. She ends up, when she finally gets to the, to the States, she ends up, instead of flying back to Chicago, she ends up riding in a van with John Candy's character, who is the most obnoxious guy. He's called Gus Polanski, the, the polka king of the Midwest, and she has to listen to hours of polka music all the way just to make it back to her son. She's willing to do anything that it would take to be reconciled with her son once again. We see this in the story of the prodigal son. Listen to these words from Luke 15, 20 through 24. So he got up and went to his father. Remember, the son had said, I'm going to go to my dad. I'm going to grovel at his feet. I'm going to say, I don't even deserve to live in a bedroom. I'm going to live in the slave quarters, but please take me back in. But what happens here? While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son. I don't know how long it has been since the son told his father, I, I don't ever want to see you again. But I imagine that somewhere deep inside that father, he knew that that wouldn't last very long. And I imagine it may be the case that every single morning as the sun would rise, so too he would go over to the hill and would look to see if maybe, maybe his son was returning. And before he went to bed in the evenings, he would look and he would send out his servants to go high and low to find if maybe the son had come to his senses and was returning again. Because when he sees him a long way off, he hikes up his robes and he begins to run. Jewish scholars will tell us that this is one of the most degrading things that an elder statesman could do to run around, right? People didn't run you know when you go to like New York or something and you're running, people think you've done something wrong? That's kind of the sense there, right? People didn't jog in those days. They weren't out for exercise. When the man is running, he is degrading himself in many ways with, because he is willing to put everything on the line to, to, to find his son again. He says he ran to his son, he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against earth. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his, to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. See, we've got this veal calf we've been saving for a special occasion. That occasion is now. That ring that was a sign of authority in his father's house, he, didn't, he, he, he lost it when he told uh, his father uh, that he would rather have him off dead, but now he's been restored. He wraps a coat around him, he puts sandals on his feet, he restores him, and he honors him in a place where he did not deserve to be honored in the slightest, and the two of them are reconciled. He says, let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Kevin's mom 
goes to any length to reconcile with her son. And in a beautiful moment, we see that when she arrives back home, Kevin is waiting and willing to embrace her again. We'll see as well what happens when the old man decides to reach out and recognize it's not too late to turn around. This is the final clip. Let's it's a Hollywood ending, right? It's beautiful reconciliation that happens with these two families where earlier Kevin apologizes. Mom says it's too late. Now she comes, apologizes to him, and he embraces her with a hug. We recognize that there are some relationships in our lives that we can only dream and pray and hope will end in this kind of Hollywood way. But it's the beauty that we see in the story of the prodigal son. It doesn't just illustrate what happens between real earthly families, but instead, just as each of Jesus' parables do, it points us to a greater truth about who God is. Because the reality is, is that when we stray, when we find ourselves far from the home that we are made for, to rest in God, and we come to our senses... When we repent of our sin, we repent of our waywardness, we repent of those times when we say, I'd rather, when I get bigger, I'd rather be grown up, I'd rather be off on my own, I'd rather be living my life my way. When we come to our senses and we turn around, we find that there's a God who's not just waiting for us, not a God who's waiting for us to come to the door and to grovel on the ground and to scratch and to claw and to beg until God finally opens that door, but instead we find a God that when we turn around, we look and over the hill, that God has come running to embrace us. It's not just true for us, it's true for those of our family members who may be far from God. It's true for those who are estranged from us and our families It's true for those who have no desire to repent of their sin right now. At the very same moment, Christ did not come and to do what he did just for some people, but for all people. That same hope is there for each and every one of us and each and every person who finds himself far from God that when we come to our senses and we turn our hearts to God, we find that God is there running and ready to embrace us. In fact, that is the Christmas story. God didn't wait until we turned around. God didn't wait until we figured it out or got it all right or kept all the commandments. No, God again and again sent prophets, did miracles, intervened and saved the people, and they still didn't get it. And so finally God decided he would do something a little bit more personal. And he came in the form of a baby Emmanuel, God with us, not God against us, not God waiting on us, not God, you got to earn God's grace, but God with us, Emmanuel, who was born in a manger, the very place where the pigs would eat. Jesus humbled himself to the point where, like the younger brother, he was, bo- he was born and laid in the very place where the pigs would eat. There's nothing that God didn't do to show God's grace and his love for you. There's no place you could go, no place you could run, no distance far from home that someone can go where God won't run and embrace them and say, welcome home, my son. Welcome home, my daughter. I've been waiting on you. Let's throw a party. Because the one who was lost is now found. Friends, that's all we can do for those in our lives who are estranged from us and estranged from God. We can pray for them. We can pray that just as we have found that grace in Jesus Christ, that they would do so as well to recognize that even when we want to give up on our loved ones or those in our, li- in, in our lives, that God never gives up. Instead, God is constantly pursuing and going after all of those who have turned away. It's what we pray for this Christmas. It's what we celebrate this Christmas, that Jesus comes to us as one of us to become just like us in every way so that he might redeem us in every way, to understand our waywardness, to understand our, our, our yearning to stray far from home and to call us to be his own once again. Friends, home alone, being home alone is overrated. It's never too late to turn back. And when we turn back, we find that God is not just waiting for us, but is running after us. 
Let's pray together. God, we thank you. We praise you for the gift of your amazing grace. Thank you for stopping at nothing to draw us near to you again and to show us your love. We thank you. We praise you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.